Time for another question show. Your questions, my answers about space and astronomy, or about how we make this, or am I actually in a forest? That kind of thing. All right, so as always, anywhere on my channel, go ahead, put in a question. I will find it, and I will answer a bunch of them here. All right, let's get started. Ball Boy 2. How much acceleration per metric unit would you need in a spaceship to make artificial gravity similar to Earth? If you wanted to feel Earth gravity, your spaceship would have to accelerate at 9.8 meters per second squared. So you need to be going 9.8 meters per second, and then a second later you need to be going 19 meters per second, and then 27-ish, right, 30. So you just need to go faster and faster and faster. And what that does is that makes it feel like you are on flat Earth. In fact, Einstein sort of imagined this thought experiment and said that you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between falling into a gravity well or accelerating, that, that that's sort of one of the whole points of relativity is, is that acceleration, whether due to movement or whether due to the pull of gravity, are essentially identical to you. Now, obviously, this is impossible with our current physics. We don't have any way to accelerate at 9.8 meters per second at 1G for a very long time. Our rockets can do like a couple of minutes at the most of that kind of acceleration. Maybe we'll have better technology in the future. But there's some really interesting implications. If you could travel at that kind of acceleration, over the course of, of a year, you would be nearing the speed of light and you would exper be experiencing so much time dilation that you would experience a tremendous amount of time difference from the people here on Earth. And in fact, you could travel, just continue to accelerate and continue to accelerate. You never actually hit the speed of light, but you feel like you're still accelerating. And you could travel billions of light years within your own human lifetime. The rest of the universe would experience billions of light years. You would have only aged, say, 20 years, and yet you could get almost out to the edge of the observable universe. So there's some pretty fascinating things. We actually did a whole video on this called How Far Can You Travel? And we'll, we'll link that up here and down in the show notes. I'm not even gonna say this name. Could there be Lagrange points of two closely orbiting massive black holes that exist within the event horizon of one of them or inside the overlapping horizons of both where a spaceship or station could exist unharmed? Black holes are just masses with gravity, and so they would create Lagrange points as well. You could have, say, a supermassive black hole, and then orbiting around that is, say, a stellar mass black hole, and that would create those five Lagrange points. You'd have one a little closer to the stellar mass black hole, one on the other side, one on the other side of the supermassive black hole, and then the two stable L4 and L5 points further along on the orbit. Could you have it be inside an event horizon and not do damage? You have to define what damage means. So if you have like a supermassive black hole that with, with millions, maybe billions of times the mass of the sun, the event horizon reaches out a long way, even like the size of the solar system. And what that causes is that you could actually go into the event horizon of a supermassive black hole and not even feel it. The tidal forces would be so low. So, so, but I don't think that you could get to have a black hole be at a point where you would end up with that sort of stable Lagrange point. You would get, still get some level of tidal forces. The other problem is that once you get inside the event horizon, the whole point is that you're never going to escape. There's no way back out. So you could have a space station inside of there, maybe orbiting the black hole, but it, in the end is going to lead to the singularity in the middle. James Minor, how would you capture a comet? You would capture a comet the way you would capture anything in the solar system. You use a thing called a gravity tractor. And that sounds really fancy, totally out of Star Trek. But the way it works is, is that you, if you put a mass close to some object, like say a comet, then the comet is going to be attracting the mass, say your spaceship, to the comet. It's gonna crash in. At the same time, the spaceship is attracting the comet towards it. So what you do is you put a rocket on the spaceship, and so as the comet is pulling the rocket down, the rocket keeps itself away, but that pulls the comet. And then slowly, you can drag the comet around. The other thing you can do, of course, is you can put some kind of exhaust thruster on the comet 
blast that off into space. Just use the material on the comet to act as its own rocket. In fact, comets do this on their own. They are putting out jets of material that change their position in orbit within the solar system. So if you're patient and you had a lot of fuel, you could move these comets around and you, in fact make the comets pay for moving themselves around. They've got the fuel. Vegan Viking. If Andromeda has twice the mass of the Milky Way, will we not be hurtling towards it rather than it hurtling towards us? Absolutely. It's pretty hilarious that, that we think of Andromeda is coming towards us and it's crashing into us, right? But Andromeda's the big bully here. Andromeda's the one with twice the mass, twice the size. It's got a supermassive black hole that is, that is far more massive. I think it's, it's is more than 100 million times the mass of the sun, while the one at the heart of the Milky Way is like four times the mass, four million times the mass of the sun. So Andromeda is the 800 pound gorilla in this scenario, and we are totally attracted to Andromeda. We are a satellite galaxy, really. We're gonna have an interaction with Andromeda and get torn apart and eventually merge up with it. So I think that's the right way to look at it. Huffy zero zero. Prove that you're not behind a blue screen and touch some plants. The background still looks so fake. Other than that, good stuff you talk about. Well, thanks, I'm glad you enjoy the good stuff we talk about. Uh, is this how conspiracy theories get started? Is this, is, this, is this gonna be the thing that we're now gonna be doing? Are there gonna be memes? And, and this is just gonna be the thing we talk about every week? Uh, cause, cause that's weird. Like if I had a green screen, do you think I would put forest behind me? Like I would have space or like, I don't know, I'd be inside some space station or it'd be like some super cool Star Destroyer or Star Wars or something. No, we're in a forest and fi fine. Here we go. All right, let's move over. Here's a tree. Look at this tree right here. It's a Douglas fir right there. It's like a Christmas tree. We have them all around. We just call them trees. I'm going back here. There you go. STP 77 rising. Why is it so difficult to name stars and planets? Why are the majority of them a combination of letters and numbers? Surely it cannot be that hard. Can it? There are a lot of stars, planets, and galaxies in the universe. And sure, for the first couple, we gave them names. But for example, when you've got projects like the Gaia mission that's going to be mapping out a billion stars in the Milky Way, you run out of names, right? You just, and so astronomers use numbers and the numbers give them a way to easily find out what they're looking for and what they're looking at. So to have a des number designation makes it easy to search in a database, lets it just allows them to work with these stars and this information a lot easier. I'm sure if really interesting things get discovered or if we start colonizing them and start sending spacecraft, then we'll start to want to give them names. But for now, the vast majority of these stars are so dim, you can only see them with the most powerful telescopes and even space-based telescopes. And really, the only people who are gonna care about their position and what they're doing and what they're made of are gonna be astronomers, and astronomers way prefer numbers over names. No name James. Did you get a new camera? The video looks really high quality. Yeah, we totally did. We got a Panasonic Lumix GH5, which is awesome. It shoots. Uh, up to 4K, it'll do 60 frames a second. We actually switched to 60 frames a second. Right now we're doing HD, but we are gonna go to 4K once Chad's computer gets a little faster and we can handle the file sizes and rendering them. And which is cool, not necessarily because you wanna see me in 4K, but because a lot of the videos and pictures that are released by the space agencies are really high resolution, so you can really see cool graphics. So uh, yeah, no, it's great. We've also got sort of a nicer setup. Um, my wife has taken over the camera work and it's really good with lighting. So we've added some lighting. Uh, I've got just better gear overall. Uh, we'll put a list up somewhere here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold up my camera and uh, so you can sort of see what the current setup looks like. It's so bright. Jelly Fox. What would happen if a ball of oxygen equal to the mass of the sun crashed into the sun? Well, I like what you're doing here, right? That, that th the sun is made of hydrogen and obviously the hydrogen isn't gonna burn because it needs some kind of oxidizer. If you brought in a ball of oxygen the size of the sun, then you would get a, you would provide the sun with oxidizer and then off we would go, right? Well, the thing is, is that <clears throat> the sun 
isn't on fire. The sun is, is compressed down and, and has a fusion reaction in the middle of it. And if you brought in oxygen, that would add to the mass of the sun. That would make a sun that was now twice the mass of that it was before. And the oxygen would add to the pressure and the mass that's going on, and it would compress the sun a lot further. And you would get, it would, it would get hotter, it would burn, it would fuse faster, and it wouldn't light on fire exactly. It would just act like a more sun-like sun. Uh, in fact, uh, XKCD did a what if on this, and we'll link to that in the, in the comments, and it's a, it's a great sort of explainer on what exactly would happen if you crashed a sun's worth of oxygen into the sun. James Haney. Would it be possible for a type four civilization to find a way to plug a singularity? And if so, what would be the effects of blocking up this intra-pan universal recycling system? I'm not sure how you could plug up a black hole. Like the only thing you could do is you could feed a black hole so much material that it chokes and the material piles up and it gets really hot and then it releases energy as a quasar. And that's what a quasar is, right? A quasar is a black hole, a supermassive black hole that is feeding so much that it can't choke it all down. And so it's actually releasing all of this additional, you know, the material piles up around it gets super hot and dense and turns into a star that releases a tremendous amount of energy. And so really, if you tried to overfeed a black hole, all you would do is create a quasar, but the black hole would still keep gobbling up all that material and eventually it would all be gone and then the quasar would shut off. And if you tried to feed it more, then you just make another quasar while the black hole made its way through it. And eventually you would make a supermassive black hole that's so big and so capable that you couldn't choke it up anymore because you just ran out of matter in the universe. So I, I like your thinking, but I, it just wouldn't work. Black holes just, they can't be killed. Kurt Reber. Hey Fraser, space elevator, what if? What if you parked in geosynchronous orbit and like a well driller attached 20 foot segments over and over pushing the ever lengthening segmented structure towards earth? Wouldn't this be a way to start the space elevator without worrying too much about it supporting its own weight? Nope. And here's, here's why this won't work. You've got your, say you've got your counterbalance, right? You've got some big asteroid that you've parked into geosynchronous orbit around the, around the Earth. And so it's going around, it's got the right spot right over top of the Earth. And then you build some kind of tether factory on the asteroid and then you lower the tether down towards the Earth. You're thinking, well, so now I don't have to worry about building a big tether and putting it into place. But the problem is, is that it's the weight of the tether. As the tether gets closer and closer to Earth, it's experiencing more and more of a pull from the Earth's gravity. And so you actually do have to deal with the tensile strength of this tether. It, in fact, this is the way that space elevators are thought that they're gonna be built. You're gonna build it from some orbit and then lower the tether down. But the problem is that the further you go, the more strength that's pulling on the tether to, by the Earth's gravity. And eventually you get it all the way down to the Earth and you bolt it onto the Earth, and now that tether is under this enormous tensile pull because of the gravity. So there's no point. I mean, sure, you could have a short little tether, but it doesn't have any function, and it doesn't experience a lot of force, but as it gets closer and closer to the Earth, it's just gonna be pulled stronger and stronger. So there's just no way around this problem. Enrique Souza, which object in the solar system is really feasible to terraform? Well, short answer is like none, right? Like terraforming is a scale of geoengineering that we can barely comprehend. And I think anyone who tells you that it's, that it's easy enough to do and we should be able to terraform Mars in a couple of centuries, da, 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 is really underestimating the amount of effort that it will take. Like all you need is like smashing a thousand comets per year, you know, whatever are the numbers, right? We can't even land a lander on a comet, barely, right? Like we tried with Rosetta and the, and the lander bounced and it was, you know, the, the, the mission was a success, but the lander really didn't work out so well. So, so which of them can you feasibly terraform? Uh, the, the only ones that are really possible to terraform are Venus and Mars. And they're two, again, enormous geoengineering, incredibly complicated projects of sort of opposite problems. Venus has too much atmosphere, Mars has not enough atmosphere, and both will be fixed in, in different ways. You could terraform other places, like the moon, for example. Uh, you could feed it oxygen, 
and, and it would hold on to that atmosphere for about 10,000 years, but then the low gravity and the solar radiation would blow it away. So I think, you know, the, the overall answer would be Venus is the place that you could terraform that in the end, if you could block the light from the sun, would be the most Earth-like place that you could do, if you could do it, which you can't, because it's, it's incredibly complicated. Mars would be the, the easiest to terraform in that you could deliver and thicken the atmosphere, but it would never be as good a place as, as Earth or a terraformed Venus. You could terraform a lot of the smaller bodies in the solar system, like the Moon and Ceres and other places like that, but it's going to be very temporary because the, they're, they don't have enough mass to hold onto their atmosphere, and that's going to be blown away by the solar wind. All right, thanks everyone for sending in their questions. Uh, if you want to ask me any question about space and astronomy, go ahead, wherever you're on the channel, on this video or any other, just type in a question and I will gather a bunch up and I will answer them here. I want to do another um, outro just in case. Oh, I can't. We have to wait the next week. Never mind. Okay, we're good.